Tales from the Wild. Stories from the Heart. A journey into the mind and soul of fired up business professionals where they share their vision for the future. And hear from a different non profit organization every month as they create awareness of their goals and their needs. Dive into a world of untamed passion as we join our host, Shireen Guerta, for this month's episode of Friends from Wild Places. All right. Hi, good day, professionals. Welcome, welcome. My name is Shireen. I am your bookkeeper and QuickBooks advisor. So let's talk about partial payments inside QuickBooks Online and how easy it is with the right bookkeeper to handle these situations. When a customer has multiple invoices and makes a partial payment to cover specific amounts towards each invoice. Inside QuickBooks, when you create a payment, it wants to add the full amount to the oldest invoice first. As your bookkeeper, I can work around the automated responses inside QuickBooks and create accurate and clean books for you, no matter the situation that is given to me. Call Shireen's Bookkeeping Services today and let me worry about those partial payments so you can do live. If you want to know more, go check it out at www.shireensbookkeeping.com and allow me to keep your books clean. Awesome. Welcome back. You are listening to Friends from Wild Places. I'm your host, Shireen Boerter, and I'm very happy to introduce to you Chris Davis. He is SVP of Mortgage Lending from San Anselmo, California, United States. It's so good to have you here. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, my friend. It's lovely to see you today. No, it's, uh, I don't know if you've been keeping up with the whole Sussexes situation oh. with Megan. And oh, oh, all of the drama. Yeah, you know, I can't avoid it. I don't really find a lot of that stuff is, uh, I don't know. I, I feel bad for them, to be honest. I feel I like do. they uh, right. They just want to have a normal life and it eludes them, right? So. I mean, their problems really aren't real life problems, I would think, right? They have enormous wealth and fame and beauty, and they just want to have a private life. But, you know, come on. I mean, right. they'll never have to work. Listen, I, 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 yeah. I, you know, this is what I think. Hurt people hurt people. And clearly mm -hmm. there are hurt feelings in the situation on both sides. Um, mm -hmm. on the royal family side and on the couple's side. And it's very sad. I think it's a very sad situation. Uh, I personally wouldn't have made it public like it is, but I guess they are a public family and a public figure. So I think it was inevitable for it to become public. Um, but I think, to be honest, you know, I think the only way to sort this out is get a mediator or some professional and get yourselves mm -hmm. to sit down as a family and sort it out and try and reconcile mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. clearly there are hurt feelings on both sides. And if that's not possible, then my advice to the couple is move on, move on, live your life. Uh, find well, they have, them. right? Yeah, I mean, they moved, they moved to the States, where right? they live in right. Santa Barbara, aren't they? Or somewhere like that. Like, right. But then this Netflix documentary was released and it's now made this big uproar because uh, more hurt feelings have been surfaced. And I'm just like, you know what? <laughs> just <laughs> move on. If it can't be reconciled and there can't be healing amongst you and your fam, just, you know, find healing quiet. Why, why do you... Why do you think they would authorize Netflix to do a documentary about them if they wanted to be in hiding and remove themselves from it? Aren't they scratching a scab? That's off? what I'm thinking. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, so that's what I'm thinking. That wouldn't have been my, you know, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have chosen to do that, mm -hmm. especially already with all the damage that's happened already and the arguments and the hurt feelings. I would have been like, no, you know what, Harry, let's just move on quietly in California somewhere and just say no to the Netflix and let's just continue with life. But this Netflix decision, I don't think was the wisest, but I, that's them. You know what I mean? <laughs> So well, I mean, thoughts. Netflix is getting played tonight, but, you know, the family, well, you know, Megan Markle, come on, she's an actress. 
Right. Maybe she misses. Maybe she misses a little bit of that attention. I don't. Know. Who knows? But, uh, right. But, I mean, what? 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 Inevitably, what is the purpose in a democracy to have a royal family anymore? What is the point? Right. They're not. They're not really anymore in any country, frankly. Right. Uh, just you know, they're wealthy and they're. Uh, uh, you know, they do a lot of uh, philanthropy, right. but nobody cares. I guess maybe the British care. I don't know. Well, you're you're part of the Commonwealth, or you were part of the Commonwealth. I don't honest, know. I love what they stand for. I love. I've always loved the royal family and what they stood for, and um, the Queen and what she stood for, and what a matriarch she was. I mean, mm. I loved her to bits. Um, the romantic, the romantic elements of it, and 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 the and and, and the Queen herself, amazing, <laughs> right? You know, but now I mean, I like the Queen. She was cool, right? I I, oh, I guess, yeah. but. Anyway. You know, what well, the, the Scandinavia still still has royal families. Spain still does, right? Yeah, there's uh, there's royal families I mean, all over the world. <laughs> yeah, it's not me. You and right. I have to work. We can't be feeling we can't be philanthropic. <laughs> exactly. As much for a full time as a full time job. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, that's all I really wanted to say about that. Though, um, so for the listeners, how I met Chris was uh, through BNI. He has just recently joined our BNI group, High Performance mm -hmm. Referrals. So Chris, I just want to hand it over to you and just ask you a question of how has BNI benefited you? Uh, you know, you know I, I didn't know what to expect. You know, when I was approached years ago to be a part of the network uh, in San Francisco, uh, my children were small and I couldn't commit a 7 a.m. in-person meeting weekly uh, because I was in charge of my kids when they were babies in the mornings. Mm -hmm. And the technology has evolved so much and I think maybe amplified in the wake of COVID where it's much more commonplace and acceptable to do business via Zoom mm -hmm. in, in a setting like BNI. Mm -hmm. And... And um, the things that I've been gravitating to related to BNI have been uh, the structure and, and the accountability to some degree. Right. Um, the things that uh, at this stage of my career, probably a good reminder uh, of you know being accountable and uh, being in front of uh, your peers, having those conversations every week. And I, I really like the individuals that are in our group. I, I really enjoy talking with all of you each week. Um, and as a mortgage originator, I get to look under the hood uh, everyone's financial world. Uh, uh, you know, needs related to uh, wealth management, insurance, self-employed bookkeeping, and CPA. I mean, I really am exposed to every but he's uh, really important personal, professional, and financial lives. Right. And so, and so, I have a lot to share. I'm a, I think I'm an important piece to this puzzle um, for all of us. Uh, giving you know, sort of a a concierge level service to consumers. Mm -hmm. It never really. I I always had occasional insurance patients that I would refer to. Or a financial advisor, um, but I wasn't. I wasn't really diligent about it. I only. I only responded when someone asked me, right. instead of asking them, "Hey, you know, do you need help with this?" Because you know, common uh, mm -hmm. response would be, "Which yes, I do. Do you have a recommendation for that?" Right. Right. So when my business is robust, um, you know, I, I, I touch six or eight new homeowners new consumers a month right. that need insurance that need you know and, and you know a lot of people in the bay area are involved in high tech mm -hmm. um and there's a fair amount of entrepreneurs here too yeah and those mm -hmm. kinds of uh, businesses and, and consumers are gonna need bookkeeping advice financial uh, wealth management 
I just have a lot of those kinds of things that, you know, frankly, the BNI exposure has helped me take a double a double take and say, hey, you know, you have really you can really offer a lot more than just mortgage to these people. Yeah. Not 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 just my service, but the services of my peers, people that I trust and like that that can represent you know their their representation of me in the long run. Like people really appreciate it when we refer them good quality uh, uh, professionals, right? And BNI is helping me with that. Absolutely. And what six? I've been with this group six months. Yeah. And it's just been really helpful. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah I agree. So if you are listening and you are looking for a uh, a networking group that you'd like to come and visit and see what it's like, you're more than welcome to come visit High Performance Referrals. We meet on Zoom. Uh, every Tuesday at 7 a.m. PST, uh, please go ahead and either click on the link for the actual high performance referrals uh, website, or you can email me at shereen at shereensbookkeepings.com. That's shereen at shereensbookkeeping.com. And we can register you for a visit. There's no pressure to join. You can just come see what it's like and see if it's your cup of tea. Uh, I always say that it is really good for most business owners to be part of a networking group. So I would, I would agree. Right. So let's begin with the quote of the day. Uh, the quote that I've got for us today, um, Chris, is strive not to be a success, but rather to be of value. And this is by Albert Einstein. So what does it mean to be of value? Well, straight from the dictionary, the regard that something is held to deserve the importance, worth, or usefulness of something. So values are beliefs that motivate people to act in a certain way. On saying that, do you agree with this statement? I would agree, of course. That yeah. seems like a pretty poignant thing to say, right? Right. Um, and what value do you bring to the people around you and in your businesses? Uh, I think as a personality, I bring a lot of humor. Yes, you do. Um, I, I bring a lot. I bring a lot of uh, calm. Right. And you know, it 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 started off as a job that became a career, and I think the difference is recognizing the value you bring to people professionally compared to transactionally. Right. Um, I like, as it turns out, I'm good at and I enjoy helping people with pride of ownership. Uh, buying a house is a foundational thing in the American dream and probably worldwide. Right. If, if you can afford to buy a home and stabilize your family, create wealth, it's a great wealth making tool. You make money living in a house just mm -hmm. by living in it and making your mortgage payment. Right. It, yeah, equity grows over time. You pay that mortgage down and you're sitting on a nice thing that you can bequeath to your kids one day or an eventual retirement, not have to make a mortgage payment anymore. So mm -hmm. I, I'm just a, I'm a huge proponent of it. And you know, there are small groups of people in this consumer age that we live in that don't understand that, but predominantly, um, you know, when people come to me and they're looking, they're like, well, gosh, my rent is so high. Right. Um, that's when you, you take the leap, you cross over and you, you, you make that mortgage payment, mm -hmm. you know, when it's, when it's equitable to your rent. Uh, that's when you buy. That's when you, that's when you cross over to home ownership. And I just really like explaining those details to people: the tax benefits, the mortgage interest deductions, things like that are really important. And most people don't understand that until they talk to a professional banker that does it every day. I joke. I joke that it comes out of my my, my pores when I sweat. You know, it's the first thing I think of when I wake up. <laughs> Uh, uh, and that's probably a, that's, that's right. probably a good thing, right? I mean, it is. It's a hundred percent a good thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, I under, I I understand every little nuance of my industry. 
That's awesome. And that's good. That's that's yeah. really good. Yeah, you want someone yeah. that's a, a professional in his profession. And not you can't say that about everybody in their profession. Mm. You know what I mean? You know, a lot of people in my business that get into it don't survive. Um, many, many do. No. But in markets like this, it really makes a difference to see um, who, who can navigate and weather environments like this because the rate market's been very volatile this mm -hmm. last year and uh, the housing industry uh, has been headed for in my opinion a very uh, necessary correction right and and so people that are yeah. recognizing in my industry you know the purchase market is you know the market's always good mm -hmm. and I say this I say this to my realtor pool uh, that uh, in markets like this, if the rates aren't attractive, you know, I'll marry the house and date the mortgage because in a year or two, I'm going to refinance you out of that higher price mortgage. But that market that wasn't so frothy and crazy enables you to buy a house maybe with less down and less competitors. Right. You were able to, you're able to get into that house. And then we rent the money until the mortgage rates come back down. Right. right. And when I say, when I say rent the money, you're, you're not in your forever loan. Yes. You're in a loan. You're in a loan that's going to get you through to the next refi boom, as they say. That makes and, sense. Yeah, and all the while, you were able to get into a house that, in a frothy rate market, when rates are really low and everybody's trying to buy, uh, it's very difficult to compete. And wow. and I like I like markets like this because I feel like there are opportunities for five percent down payment instead of the right. cash instead of 50% down, instead of paying two or 300,000 over list price, which is what you get in the Bay Area in property markets, it's crazy. Right. right. People are paying people are paying over list price what you would pay for a house in most of middle America in bulk. And that, you know, I mean the cost of entry in the Bay Area where I live, you know, yeah. it's probably an average of uh, over a million dollars, well over a million dollars. Right. And that's a, that's a lot of money globally. It that's is. a lot of money. Right. Yeah. So for the listeners, as you can hear, he's very knowledgeable at what he does, and it's fantastic. And he makes it very understandable, um, which is which is how you should speak to people that are not fluent in the uh, mortgage lending world. So I love the way you explain things, Chris. Um, I'm talking about, you know, challenges. What has been your biggest challenge personally? And what have you learned from that being a mortgage uh, lender? Oh, gosh. What, would, what, what can you say is a challenge in the marketplace? Well, you know, I think, I think what we ended up with at the beginning of this year, uh, COVID created a rate market that translated to a, a buyer expectation that was unreasonable. There was a lot of entitlement being brewed here in the universe. Yeah. And it's taken most of this year to remind people that the mortgage rate that we're currently in is more normalized. And that what we saw in 2000 and 20 and 21 and at the beginning of this year, the first quarter, that was um, a rate market that was, it was fantasy land, it was Disneyland because it was, it was managed by the Federal Reserve uh, deliberately bring rates down to counter the chaos that was happening in the wake of COVID. And that, and that, we haven't had a pandemic in a hundred years. So in our lifetimes, we've never seen anything like this. And probably in our lifetimes, we won't see anything like this again, hopefully. Yep. And so, you know, the challenge has been reminding people that what we saw in 2021 wasn't a normal market. Right. It wasn't a realistic rate expectation. Historically, since World War II, rates are on 30-year fixed benchmark products, you know, between four and six percent is a good market. Right. And seller expectations of rate. So seller expectations on how much they're going to get for their house 
have been corrected, and I think consumers' expectations have been correct for the normal market. And you know, I don't think you should expect three percent on your rate. I think you should expect six percent. That's normal. That's normal. And yeah. people always laugh. They always try to date themselves and let you remind you how long they've been in the industry. In the 80s, there was a, a savings and loan crisis here in the States where rates approached 14, 16, I think even 18%. Um, but I don't think we'll see that again. I think that they can keep rates low enough uh, not to have that kind of um, restrictive policy to well, inflation. And that's what they've been doing with rates, is just trying to keep inflation from overheating. Um, right. And there's been a lot of talk about the Fed Reserve having managed that this year. You know, I think they've they've stepped on the brakes mm -hmm. and cal cal calmed things down. Yeah. And that's what they that, that was their intention. That's good. Yeah. So yeah. That you know, so, so yeah. Yeah. No, um, I think yeah. um you know, it's amazing uh, where we've come from and just, you know, what the pandemic has done and the lessons we've learned from it. And, you know, we're we fine. One would say that we're out of a pandemic, but not really. We have the aftermath that we're going through right now. And as you were talking about the aftermath of the market and what it is now, and we just, you know, we just push through Um and keep it's going. Gonna take, it's, gonna, it's gonna take time. I mean, I, does, I don't yeah. think I, I I don't think we're even halfway through emerging psychologically from the damage that that isolation did to all of us and yeah. our children. There's yeah. a lot of a lot of damage that needs to get worked through. A lot of habits that were formed that need to be uh, resolved and recovered from. I mean. I was just talking to my wife the other day and we were laughing how COVID yeah. has sort of changed the way we operate, you know. Um, we're trying to get back to, you know, meals at the dinner table as a family every night, right. doing the things that we were doing prior to COVID. Right. Again, because it kind of came off the rails for a while, right? I mean, things yeah. were a little weird. But, uh, you know, I think for the uh, youth, I think that isolation is damaging. Yeah. Not yeah. being able to go to school and develop that social skill, uh, that's going to take some time to work through the system. It's going to be four or five years, I would think. You know, oh, before, yeah. yeah, yeah, but you know, but I'm grateful to be healthy. I got COVID in July. I've had all the boosters. <laughs> Gosh. You know, I mean, it's right. no fun, no fun, but at least I'm not on a respirator. No, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if you are watching, uh, you might see that Chris is in um, what what doesn't look like an office, but it's kind of his office in a way. He's currently uh, sitting in his second baby, which is his boba shop. He owns a boba yeah, shop. I do. And, and for uh, those of those of you internationally, what is boba? Oh, what is it? Boba is massive. Boba is a massive universal. We all mm -hmm. love boba, and those people that don't love boba, they know about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Very popular. So, why? so you want to know? Why you want to know a little? Shop? Why? Why did? Uh, in twenty seventeen or twenty eighteen, a good friend of mine who's been in this same industry as long as I have and then a peer of mine in every bank that I've worked at a gentleman named Peter who lives in the South Bay in San Jose in the heart of Silicon Valley about an hour hour and a half from me we went to interview with the bank together and afterwards he said hey Chris I want to show you something have you ever heard of oh and I had not heard of it before so we went to uh, a little shop together and he told me what to get and I had it for the first time and I liked it I didn't think anything of it I thought it was refreshing I noticed that the place was mobbed with teenagers and he goes well hey I'm just uh I'm opening one of these franchises down here what do you think and I said hey that's great that sounds like fun it's a good, 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 good idea right and I and I didn't think of it again except for when I started going to another franchise during COVID. My daughters got the app on the phone. And every week they're like, Dad, let's go get some books. 
And every time he went to this little shop, there was a line five people deep. Right. And during COVID, during COVID, they wouldn't let you into the store. You would order on the app, and then they would put it on a little table out in front of the store. Uh, and this location yeah. had the worst parking. Uh, it was just not a yeah, not a great there. location. It's still there, uh, but it inspired me and made me realize, man, if I put a nice brand in a nice location, I bet it would be really popular. Mm -hmm. And we ended up opening the last weekend of August. It's been three months, and there are days where there's a line out the door of this place, which I can't believe. Wow. Um, uh, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been a lot of stress I mean, and work, there, but sure, uh, it's been really exciting. And my daughters work for me, which is really cute. That is so, so cool. Right. Yeah. 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 And I was going to be in my office for this uh, meeting today. And it turned out I had to come in. So you get to That's see it perfect. firsthand. Exactly. <laughs> that's lovely yeah. and it's also great because i wanted well, the listeners yeah, to hear uh, that yeah. you know you yeah. not only you've got many trades that you do and you are uh, a business owner as well as a mortgage lender uh, um, okay, so yeah. you really do uh, have an interesting yeah. life and that's why i was so happy and excited to have uh, you as a co-host on the show today strong. so um, I do have a second person that I'd like to invite into the room. She is my non-profit. So, Mary, let's admit her into the room before we continue. <laughs> Mary, can you hear us? And for the listeners, if you are watching on YouTube, you might notice that I have some jingling and some flashing lights. This is the Christmas episode. Wow, look at Mary. <laughs> Mary's just entered the room and she's got her Christmas hat on. So, oh, you got a Christmas tree in the back there as well. <laughs> I've got some... My my little uh, pole here has the the garn the garnish. The whole store is pretty decorated. Actually, I'll show you. I love it. I love the fact that we're about to get a nice. See, little see that? Nice. Yeah, yeah. A little Christmas. That and then up on the up on the shelves, there's a little Santa and stuff. We got a little Santa going on here. Love it's pretty it. Pretty cute. Oh, and of course the the big. There's the wreath. The love it. Yeah. Gotta have a wreath. Gotta have a wreath, right? Wow. <laughs> Thank you for the tour of your boba shop, Chris. Yeah. Much appreciated. Yeah. For the listeners, if you want to go and see, you can go check it out on the YouTube version of Friends from Wild Places. So you can have a look at Chris's boba shop. But yes, mm -hmm. I'm so excited mm -hmm. to have you on the show, Mary. Um, this is Mary Jenkins. And she is CEO of Cancer Option Collaborative in Ho Ohio, United Hi. States. So very warm welcome right, to you. Good. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. That's awesome. So um, Chris was busy telling us about his boba shop and why he went into becoming a boba shop owner. And so I started off this podcast uh, with a quote, Mary, and the quote is, strive not to be a success, but rather to be of value. So this is by Albert Einstein. And so I wanted to ask you, you know, what value do you bring, Mary, to your surroundings? Wow, I've never been asked that question before. It's a pretty um, deep question, yeah. It is. Well, I guess... I bring hope. That's something that I am very, very passionate about. Um, I work in the cancer space to help them to understand they're not alone, that somebody is really in their corner and that they can make it. And so, I mean, that I bring hope. Just, I mean, just that, that's I love that. My, I love that. Hey, hope. Yeah. No, I thank you for sharing. It's refreshing. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Mary, do you have a podcast? I can't remember if you told me you had a podcast. I have a po I have a podcast um, and it's it's called Real Let's Talk Cancer because people are battling cancer. What about the struggles that they face? So let's talk about it. Let's have real conversations about the struggles that people that are in active treatment have. And I said I'll just do it as a once a week, you know, 
put a post up on social media and people were like, when is the podcast? When are you going to have the podcast? And mm-hmm. I, so I said, okay, so January is my anticipated launch date for my podcast. Well, Mary, I'm ready. For you, to starting, up, starting off the year large. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm excited. Thank you, Mary. And talking about Thank podcasts, you. I started this podcast to share stories from other business owners and to bring support for young entrepreneurs all over the world. When business owners start out, we have such fire in our hearts and excitement to start our own businesses. But when things get tough, I want us to know that we're not alone. I feature nonprofits every month to try and make a difference or give a helpline to someone in need. Are you looking for a new marketing oh, yeah, channel uh, or do you have a message you want to share with the world? Or maybe you just think it'll be fun to have your own talk show. Podcasting is an easy, inexpensive and fun way to expand your reach online. To start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card, follow the link in the show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know we sent you and help support our show. Buzzsprout. Let's create something great together. (laughs) So one of the questions I wanted to ask you, Mary, is, you know, first, tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from. Okay, well, I am a two-time cancer survivor, which that's part of what started my whole life journey. Um, Prior to that, I'm a mother. I have three sons, Edwin, Joseph, and Jerry. And my son, Edwin, and and his wife, Candace, have my grandson, who is named Jude. And there's one on the way, so I'm excited about that. I'm also a veteran. Um, I was in the U.S. Army, and I was married. My husband was in the Army as well. And he, unfortunately, passed away um, on active duty. And so I'm a surviving spouse of a military person. I am a notary and I'm an author, but I find most passion is that I am also a preacher and I've been in ministry for about 30 years. Wow, that's amazing. So tell me what happened for you to open your nonprofit? What happened for me was I was going through active treatment. So I was diagnosed with stage three, almost stage four invasive ductal carcinoma. So that's breast cancer, triple negative. So that's the most aggressive kind. And I had started doing aggressive chemotherapy while trying to go to work. And it was making me sick. And I was getting sick at work. And my employer found me in the bathroom on the floor a couple of times. And so they made a decision that I needed to not work there anymore so that I could focus on recovering. Okay. I thought that was going to be a great thing. So now I don't have to get up and go to work. But what I didn't realize was I was not going to work. And then I didn't get a paycheck. And when I didn't get a paycheck, then then I had bills that needed to be paid. And I reached out to the Susan G. Komen Foundation to get help. And is their breast cancer. So I figured that's who you call. And at the time, they didn't offer financial assistance to people that were in treatment. And so I couldn't understand how they were raising millions of dollars, but none of it was going to actually help the people that had cancer. And so they referred me to the American Cancer Society and to um, the Livestrong Foundation just to try to get help. And I found out that none of them offered financial assistance. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. There's millions of dollars that's raised and it's not going to help the people actually battling the disease. I did find a couple places that offered financial assistance, but it was like $500 once in your life. And you had to, you know, you had to live in the city, be this type of income. And there were so many different um, eligibility requirements and I wasn't meeting them. And so I didn't have help. And I ended up turning to my church and was like, I don't understand this. This doesn't make sense. I'm about to lose everything. Mm -hmm. My church offered to help me, which was a blessing for me. But in that moment, I thought, you know, it's like, what about all the other people that are battling breast cancer that need help? I'm not the only one because if if I'm not going to work, chances are they're not going to work. And if they, if I'm not finding help, (laughs) they probably not find it. Somebody needs to do something. And so I told my pastor, uh, somebody needed to do something to help make people aware of where money does and doesn't go in the world of cancer. And he agreed. 
And I said, we've got to find someone. And he said, right, Mary. And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, yes. <laughs> and I was like, I can't do that. I'm shy. You know, I don't like to talk to people. And he said, really, Mary? No, that is not you. And so uh, I began a journey of telling people where money did and didn't go in the world of cancer. And they just started saying, well, I don't want to give to those groups. Can I give it to you to make sure it gets to somebody? I was like, sure. My church is paying my bills. And so I'll find somebody else to give the money to. And that was 17 years ago. So wow. for the last 17 years, I have been raising money to help people that are battling cancer so that they don't get evicted from their homes or their utilities get turned off, the car get repossessed, or just whatever, whatever they come up with. I have been raising money to help people for 17 years now. Wow. And now you're, you're an inspiration. Goodness. Isn't she? She's amazing. You. Chris. <laughs> um, I, listen, Mary, I got to I don't think I've heard of another nonprofit that does that. So um, thank you for what you're doing and thank you for your service that you, you, you know, you did for your country. That's appreciated as well. Thank you. Thank um, you. When I, when we applied to become a nonprofit, so that so like when you're a nonprofit, you can get larger dollars from donors. Um, even the IRS said, we've never heard of an organization that wanted to help people battling cancer. And I was like, I know that's why I want to do it. It, and seems, crazy it seems kind of absurd. Was all the money being raised? Is that going to cancer, research? Cancer research, and awareness. So like when they have all the little pamphlets and things of giving people information, you know, they do that. And then they'll, they'll, they'll pay people to host support groups for people battling cancer. But the people battling cancer are there because they're stressed out because they haven't been able to pay their bills. Wow. And it's like, no one had thought about this. And what made it so bad, and, I'm, and I say bad, but it really was a blessing. Right. When I started the organization, we were focused on breast cancer because I had breast cancer and that's what I knew. Mm -hmm. And when we were four months old, we got a referral of a woman that had cervical cancer. And I told her we couldn't help her because she had the wrong type of cancer, which was crazy. Mm -hmm. But I was like, did I? did I just say that? And she said it was okay. And I was like, no, it's not. Oh my God. I, I did not even realize it. Right. And so I made some phone calls, had a conversation with my board members and said, I never want to tell someone they had the wrong type of cancer ever again. Absolutely. And they said, Mary, are you sure? And I said, yes. And mm -hmm. so whew, we changed our mission to include all cancers. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, the American Cancer Society found out about us and we started getting referrals from all over the country. And then we got referrals from Canada and Mexico and it just spread. And so we've gotten referrals from all over the world. And we're like, how, how did this happen? How I love did, that. I, it was not what I planned for. But the right. thing is the, the, the well-known cancer organizations, and I say quotation marks, they still don't provide financial assistance. They don't, they just don't. And so we get everybody and we're like, whew. We fundraise all the time. Well, that's my next question is what can we do for you? How can we help you? I have, so I have two projects too. Okay. One, I didn't even realize I was going to have until like two weeks ago. Um, a, a company found us and said, we want to donate $5,000 to you. And I was like, oh my God, that's so fantastic. They said, but. We're going to do it as matching dollars to uh, encourage your donors to give also. And nice. so we're like, okay, well, we'll put the word out there and we will do it. So we have been fundraising to get to the 5,000. But then I also have a challenge that I've been working on. And I'm call me crazy. Or I think outside the box. <gasps> I want to find 10,000 people that will agree to donate $5 a month for a year. And when you think about that, that's not a lot. $5 is not a lot. But when you have 10,000 people donating $5, that's $50,000. And if that happens every single month, how many people can we really help? And mm -hmm. so I'm like, I'm on a mission. So I talk about it all the time. I'm like $5, $5, $5. I'll, I'll add myself to that list, Mary. Can I add myself to that list? I'll, I'll yes. be that person. Yeah, we'll speak about it afterwards and I'll I'll get the details of how I can um, 
link my bank account up or however I need to pay. Awesome. But yes, awesome. I'll do that. Thank you. And that's the thing that we like, like people are like, well, we want to donate clothes. We don't, we, we appreciate the clothes and those are great. Right. But if a person doesn't have a home or their lights aren't on, you know, that, that those are the things that we really, really focus on. Or if they don't have a car to get back and forth to treatment. Um, yeah. We had a family, they were on their way to treatment and the car broke down and they made it to the hospital. The little girl was in treatment and the hospital called us and we're like, okay, we'll make some phone calls and find someone to pick the car up and repair the car and we'll pay for it and get the car back to the family. Nobody else does stuff like that because that's just not their thing. Right, right. Yeah, that's amazing. And for the listeners, if you're listening right now and, you know, Mary's story touched your heart, well, you feel moved that that's you. You'd like to be that person that donates $5 a month for just a year. A year out of your entire life um, is nothing, guys. So if I can encourage you, if you can, please go ahead. Uh, all Mary's contact details are going to be in the show notes. So um, you have no excuse. But yeah, so for, yeah, Chris, go ahead. I was going to say, Mary, I'm going to introduce you to my company, which is pretty philanthropic. And I wonder if some connections there, uh, I bet I could touch many, many uh, contributors. So we'll talk offline one day and I'll, I'll, I'll line that up. I love that. Right. This is the I best will, time of the year. I know. I will link you and Chris up. So don't worry, I've got details and I will link you guys up um, ASAP. So there's networking right there for you. It's amazing. Um, so the next question I want to ask you guys is, you know, being business owners, Chris, you're a mortgage lender. You're also a owner of a boba shop. Mary, you own your own nonprofit doing amazing things for people that are suffering um, with cancer and having to live a life still outside of that. Um, did that, being a business owner, did that come naturally or did you have to nurture that side of yourself? Uh, Mary, you go ahead. Um, it did not come naturally. <laughs> uh, not in this this direction. I've always wanted to try to be a business owner and I always you know, put my little hands in doing different things. But when it came down to realizing something that was so huge, that there was such a big need, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I, I literally, I prayed a whole lot. It was like, I don't know who, who I'm supposed to talk to who or anything. And yeah. so what sustained me is I made a confession. So I have a confession that I say every day. And that is that God has great people that are ready to help me in the right way. And at the right time, people, I don't even know it yet. So I won't give up when it looks like I don't have the help that I need. And that became my everyday thing. So whenever I needed something, I was like, I don't know who I'm going to meet, but yeah. it's going to be somebody that's going to be able to help me. Absolutely. So I, I grew I, into it. I agree. And may I just say, I uh, also never, I mean, if you told me 10 years ago that I was going to be a business owner, I would have said you're smoking socks. There's no way. It's just, that's, I'm not even interested in something like that. But now going along and being a business owner, um, you know, it does, it, you can only have so much knowledge. You know, the rest has to actually be experience and, and as you go along in life. So in the beginning, it feels like you're faking it until you're making it kind of thing. Um, but as the longer you're in, the more experiences you build, um, the more experienced you are as a business owner and the more you grow in your knowledge and power of being a business owner. So that's definitely true for me because the right people at the right time have just come into my life and have guided me in the right direction um, as a business owner. So I'm very grateful for that. Very grateful. What about yourself, Chris? Well, I would just add that you know, every exciting, meaningful thing that I've done in my life was stepping out of my comfort zone. 
And, you know, I, I think I've, I heard a quote or I, I, I learned something once that said, you know, life begins outside of your comfort zone. Right. So I think for people that are self-employed or endeavoring to do something meaningful, you don't have to be an expert out the gate, you know, just don't make the same mistake twice. Get out there and do things, build on that. And over time, you're the expert. You know, when I first got into mortgage, I didn't really know that much about it. Right. Hi. And the person that I am today um, from 22 years of being an originator, you know, like I mentioned lunch. to you earlier in the pocket. Yeah. I mean, it comes out of my pores when I sweat, like I mentioned. Yes. Right? Well, so and much. I think, <laughs> and I think, I think Mary's contribution to the universe, you know, you think about where she started and what she knows now, the connection she has now, she's an expert yes. in what she's doing. And you just need to go out there and reach for it and get up every day take a deep breath and make your best effort and you become the expert right so uh i i didn't expect to be a boba shot uh, uh you know that I'll, we'll talk about that some other time it's my teenagers driving that one but i i think it's exciting right I, why why do things that are not as meaningful or impactful uh, do them for someone else why not do it for yourself and, and drive that bus the direction you want to be you know, love want that. to be going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely love that, Chris. So thank you very much. You know, being business owners as well, um, I I get it. You get busy. I get it. Emails start building up uh, to the point that they get lost. Um, time just flies by and you wonder, you know, there's not enough hours in the day to get everything done. Um, I get it. So it also tires one out. Uh, you get burnt out very quickly. Um, and I know I, and it's very hard because at times you have to turn to your clients and go, all right, I've got everything, you know, under wraps. I've got everything sorted out for you, but I'm going to be away for these few days and you won't be able to reach me. Um, and during that time, you recoup, you do whatever you love, you do whatever that is that makes you alive from the inside out, and you do that. Um, so what is that thing that you do that refills your tank? So Chris, you go this time. What is that one thing or two things? Well, what refills my tank? Uh, I, I struggle uh, as a 50-something to uh, not get uh, overwhelmed with the communication vehicles all around us now, the websites, text, phone calls, emails. I, it's a little exhausting. Yes. And it doesn't let your brain turn off if you're not careful. You know, my teenagers are looking at their phones all the time. It drives me crazy. It's like, can't you just be in the present without all that peripheral stuff influencing decisions you're making and, you know, consuming all of your time? And the way that I get away from it is I hop on my mountain bike, get out into the mountains. People yes. can't reach me. Um, it really refreshes. It, I think physical activity is really important for your mental right. cleansing, if you will. You know, uh, it, it really helps me. And you know, I, I fight it, uh, but it's it's not easy. But you have to make an effort to put this little guy down sometimes. That's true. No. Otherwise, otherwise you just aren't in, you're not present. You're not yes. You know, and uh, that it saddens me a little bit because I think COVID had an impact on the generation just behind us. But I, um, I make a conscious effort of fighting that right. because if I do, I get if I don't do that, then I get wound up. I don't sleep. I grind my teeth. I can't stop. I can't turn off my brain. Right. So uh, you really have to make an effort to take care of yourself, exercising and turning off the connectivity. That's you know, so because true. if you're not careful, if you're not careful, you're 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 sucked into that vortex every minute, and it's mm -hmm. not healthy. Right. It's right. Not healthy, you know. And I said, you know, I said take a few days. You know, it doesn't have to be days. It can be a few hours. You know, go stop. Put lower the laptop 
screen down, put the phone away, go jump onto your mountain bike, go for an hour or two. I mean, I've just come back from a California and I've got to be honest, there's so many amazing places just down the road that is beautiful in nature and stunning. And I'm sure in Ohio um, is the same thing, Mary. I, I haven't been to Ohio um, so I'm sure there is beautiful nature spots there as well. So take a few hours. What about yourself, Mary? Ooh wee! I'm gonna tell on myself. Um, <laughs> so I'm down. I'm down from having six cell phones down to three. Six. <laughs> right. <laughs> I am down. Um, I travel. Oh gosh, I travel two to three weekends every month starting in January, from January to November, I am gone. Like we, and I go on the weekend. So I'm gone Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, sometimes Tuesday. And then I'm home Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays, but I'm working during that time. And so, um, for the first year I was like, I'm not doing anything in December. I'm not leaving no. the city. I'm going to be home. I'm going to be present. I'm going to enjoy my time because there's so much that happens that I miss. Right. And I was like, oh. so I started doing that. And then I said, you know what? I'm going to turn my phones off. And it got to the point where I forgot to turn them back on. And I'm just like, when I'm like, I haven't gotten any phone calls today. I wonder why. And then I'm like, look at my phones are off. And I'm like, oh my God, what in the world has happened? And so it's like, I now really, really appreciate um, the silent time. I, yeah. I do like to ride in my car and just ride with no, no sound, just nothing. Just right. silence. Right. Um, and it's crazy. Oh, I, I do that a, too. I have a mountain bike. I have, I have a mountain bike. I just, it's going to sound horrible. I've got to find somebody to come and put air in the tires because I don't know how. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and once I do, I want to go riding. I want to have the time away because I dealing the fact that I deal with cancer patients every single day. Right. People get diagnosed with cancer and they die. Um, people that I have had conversations with and they die. And knowing that I'm a two-time cancer survivor myself, I've had you know the most aggressive chemos that you can have. So if cancer decides to come my way again, there's no treatment options for me. And so it's important that I have the family time, the self time, the time away from it, just so that I don't lose, I don't lose myself mm -hmm. um, in the midst of it all. Cause you really can. And when you said, Chris, when you said, um, you don't, you, you don't sleep and then you grind your teeth. I was like, oh my God, he has talked to my dentist. Um, <laughs> Cause I recently, I recently went to the dentist and he was like, you, you're grinding your teeth, aren't you Mary? And I was like, mm. so when I get frustrated about, stuff that happens in the world of cancer, I tend to grind my teeth. And he was like, yeah, you, you, you got to work on that. So, <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think that that is a, uh, a residual of this hyper-focused connectivity world that we live in. We don't get to turn off. Right. And it's and it's not good for us, right. you know. I mean, hair creeps into your bed at night. You're laying there thinking about stuff, grinding your teeth with tension. Oh. It's not good. Not at you all. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. So we got to work on that as a community, and you know, I mean, the world the world uh, needs to take a break. Once mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, my family done. and I have dinner. You know, all cell phones. We cell phones are off. They're, or they're on vibrate, but they're somewhere away. We do not, during the time when we're having family dinner, we do not get on our phones at all. Yeah. It, it's totally family time. And, yeah. and, and, we're, and we're more productive when we're rested and refreshed. You know, if you work, if, if, if I find the last hour or so of a work day, I'm kind of losing steam. Right. I'm not that productive. You know, that's that's time for me to go home and, and relax. Right, and be refreshed and be be strong the next day. Mm -hmm. A hundred percent. I am the same way. Especially, I'm most productive in the morning. Um, but the problem is, you know, with my business, I work on the the Pacific Standard Time, so a lot of my work is done from about four p.m. to about ten p.m. It's now quarter to ten at night on a Friday. And so um, I've really had to get used to that part 
But any of the strenuous not working with numbers, you know, my spreadsheets and stuff, if I know I need to get that done, I do it in the morning. I do it in the morning because I know I'm fresh and I leave my meetings and everything in the evenings. Um, but, you know, what I wanted to say is stress comes out in so many different shapes and forms and it can be misdiagnosed very easily. And we need to watch that because if you start having these physical symptoms, whether it be grinding your teeth or um, insomnia or whatever the case may be, some people pick at their skin, some people pull their hair out, you know, whatever it, it can be. There's millions, millions of different symptoms that your body can start doing to say, hey, you're stressed. You need a time out. <laughs> So what I want you to know is always listen to your body. Your body tells you when you need to um, have that time out. So thank you for sharing that with me, guys. I really appreciate it. We have come to the part of the podcast where we play a little bit of a game and get a little bit lighthearted. So we're going to play agree or disagree. So I'm going to say a statement and then we can raise our hands if we agree and not raise our hands if we disagree. And we can agree to disagree. We are all friends here. Um, it's a very safe space. And for the listeners, don't worry, I will let you know who has put up their hands and who hasn't. And then um, we can chat about uh, why we agree or why we disagree. So the first statement is... Being a short person is better than being a tall person. Okay. All right. So for the listeners, no one put their hands up. So clearly there's only tall people in the room here. <laughs> because oh, I, I love tall short. people and short people. <laughs> just, just grab a glass from the count, you know, the cabinet. That's just a little easier, you know. That's all. Right. And when you're in like a massive crowd of people, whether you're at a concert or you're at Harry Potter World and you're watching, you know, the, the light show at Hogwarts, then you're tall. You can see over everyone. It's lovely. <laughs> but a short person has a lot more comfort on an airplane, in a car. So, you know, we have to represent everybody here. Right. I agree. Okay, well, I'm representing the tall people because, you know, I, <laughs> I I'm only 5'5", five, five, so I, I'm not really considered a tall person. Okay, okay, I see where you're at, Mary. I like it, <laughs> I like it. We should be more inclusive, you're right. Okay, so the next statement is, hmm, money does equal happiness. Mm, okay, I think I'm um I'm, I'm I'm with my crowd of people here because for the listeners, no one put up their hands because we do not believe that money equals happiness. Um, I will let Chris tell me why you disagree with that statement. Uh, well, I mean, from a personal perspective, yes, yeah, you know, there was a time in my young life when I was in college and I had, you know, 40 or 50 bucks to get me through the week. And I had to eat a lot of spaghetti, um, but I was still having the time of my life. Having a great time, you know, playing beach volleyball and, you know, using the change in the ashtray for gas. And that's, that was a fun time in my young life. Mm. And counter to that, in my industry, I see people, especially where I live, there's a lot of wealth here, and I see a lot of miserable wealthy people that are consumed with the wealth and consuming, but really are not happy at all. Right. And uh, I think that that is, I think, I think wealth creates some stability. But is not a formula for happiness. I love that. Um, yeah, no, I agree with you. You took the words right out of my mouth, Mary. Do you you disagree with this statement? Do you have anything to correct. add? Um, money does not equal happiness, but mm -hmm. money does give you the medium to make possible activities 
to make you happy. Uh, and so it's just understanding it because even, you know, the scriptures say, the, the, you know, the love of money is the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's really what a person is not, or mo they say money is the, is the root of all evil. And it's not that it's money. It's not the money. It's the heart that's attached to it. Mm -hmm. And so money doesn't make you happy at all. It just gives you the ability to be able to fly to Disney or to be able to donate or to be able to do different things. And it's those things that really bring us happiness and can make us fulfilled. Yes. Yes. I agree with you. I find that my happiness, and this obviously comes from experience as well. Um, I mean, I fought for the money. I worked myself to the bone to get more hours, to get paid more. Um, and I was never happy, never happy. And I actually was uh, actually quite, quite depressed actually. Um, but what I did find, and thanks to the pandemic for this, I, so I would never have been able to stop and actually figure this out. But because we all had to stop and stay indoors, I got a chance to really figure out that my happiness came from actually helping others. So I, I think it was like I did a fundraiser one time and I loved how just helping others you know, made me feel, and it might be for, true for me. I don't know if it's true for everyone, but I feel like I'm on this earth to help others, whether that be to fundraise, whether that be to lend a helping hand when, you know, when someone asks or offer it when there's a need, whatever that might be, um, that's where I find my happiness. So, yeah, I really appreciate that, guys. I think we have time for one more uh, comment, or should I say statement? It goes like this. Showing up late is disrespectful. Mm. <laughs> Wait, if you agree, then you need to put up your hands. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for the listeners. Chris and Mary. Uh, I, Go ahead. I, I, well, I, I think it, I think if you know if somebody has a traffic issue or a transportation issue, it's excusable. But if it's a consistent pattern of behavior for somebody, I don't think that's respectful. You know, and I'll speak to this just for a moment. I think that one of my massive peeves in the universe is going to see healthcare professionals when I go see my physician. <laughs> and they make me wait in the lobby for an hour and then a half an hour in the waiting room, I think that's massively disrespectful to me because of my time is also valuable. And I have to really you know, have some introspection there and say, okay, well, they're busy. Somebody showed up really ill today. But you know, those kinds of things you really have to manage through. But if it's a pattern of behavior, I actually fired a physician once because I got sick of waiting in their lobby mm -hmm. for an hour. It's like, okay, well, schedule me an hour later next time. Right. So I stopped seeing that position no. because I just, you know, speaking to your question, um, it's not respectful of the other person's time that you're meeting with or you know, the appointment that you're making. Or something. Yeah. You know, that's what I think. So right. I'm going to meet right. myself now. <laughs> I'm, I'm in agreement with Chris. I am I am fully in agreement. Um, fortunately, all my doctors have become my friends because they've been the same ones on my whole journey. And so I have their cell phone numbers. So <laughs> if something's going on, I can send them a text message. And, you know, <laughs> so I developed that because, because of what I do, my time is, it's so valuable. I can't sit for an hour waiting to go in another room to sit for 20 minutes. And then you come in and you're there five minutes, and then we're done. And you're going to charge me a crazy amount of money. We're not doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, so is that now I will say that, um, it definitely is disrespectful. So if I'm in, if I'm driving to a meeting and traffic is heavy, I can tell I'm going to be late. Mm -hmm. And so if I don't call that person or text that person something to say, Hey, I'm running late. That's disrespectful. Mm -hmm. I have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Um, people that show up you know, oh my God, we're going to do something right at, you know, it starts at two and they show up right at two. No, because you have to get ready and prepare. And so my thing, and I taught this to my kids as well, 10 to 15 minutes in advance. All right. 
And then that way we can start right on time. You're in the moment and then we can do what we have to do. I so. get it. Yeah, I, I'm totally with down with that. I, I mean, you know, I, the only reason why I disagree with it is because I am sometimes very guilty of, of pitching up um, late. And it's not a, a habitual thing per se, but I, I know I've done it. And I've always phoned the person to say that I'm running late. So to to your point, Mary, um, and I'm always apologetic when I get there, but I know I, it's out of no disrespect. <laughs> um, so it's not intentional. It's not no, like you, not at all. No, but I, I think that's it becomes, different. I think it's disrespectful if it's a pattern of you know, behavior. I think occasionally yeah. because of circumstances, and if you're communicating. It's accepted. If right. you're not communicating and it's a pattern of behavior, then that's not respectful. Yes. I will tell you, I learned this. Um, I had to fly to Vegas and they usually say at the airport arrive two hours in advance. Right. I got caught in traffic and had to go all the way around. So I arrived less than an hour before my flight and they almost would not take my luggage. They, yeah, they, they, yeah, and yeah. I was like, I thought you had, I thought you had to have your luggage here, you know, 30 minutes. And they said, no, you have to have your luggage checked in an hour before your flight. And wow. so I was like, you don't understand. This is why I'm traveling. I'm going to raise money for people battling cancer. <laughs> and it just so happened that the person that I was talking to had a family member that had battled cancer. And she was like, I'm, I'm going to get it on the plane for you. And I was oh. like, thank you. So, much. Oh, that was so I mean, there are boundaries that are put specifically to make certain that the operation of business can still happen and mm -hmm. so to show up you know show up late you might get your feelings hurt right right i'm with you thanks guys that was that was fun i appreciate you taking part with me um we have come to the end of the podcast but i'd like to just take some time to thank both you chris and mary for just taking the time out of your busy days and just being on Friends from Wild Places. Um, I'd like to finish off by, Chris, if you weren't mind just sharing some social media places or anywhere where, where people can reach out to you. Uh, well, being in sales and in the mortgage business, I am so easy to find. My name is so easy to remember. If you Google my name, mortgage, uh, San Anselmo or guaranteed rate, I'm all over the place. Mm -hmm. I often tell customers that I'm easy to find and I do that on purpose. So just Google my name and mortgage. There I am. Nice. <laughs> I like that. That's Chris Davis, yeah. guys. For yeah. those that are listening, yeah. Chris Davis. So go and look him yeah. up. You'll find him. <laughs> what about yourself, Mary? I mean, specifically I'm asking because I know if there are listeners that have made a connection with just listening to you speak and want to know more about your journey or want some advice and they have a question, this is why I ask you guys just to share where they can reach you. So Mary, what about you? I can be reached on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Snapchat, you name it. I Mary Jenkins. I'm really me. Um, <laughs> I look like me. I, I don't come up with all the creative names and stuff like that I'm like uh, it's enough and so if you, and if you do a google search and do mary jenkins cancer you'll you get all but i did recently i found out that there's somebody else named mary jenkins um yes. and i'm like we have to separate this. so some app put our all of our podcasts together and i'm like no we are two separate people and we you know gotta figure that out so Oh my goodness! That's one of my things. I'm gonna do. Maybe, maybe you should have you should you should have a podcast with Mary Jenkins. <laughs> now that that would be interesting. That's a plan. <laughs> I'm Mary Jenkins, and I'm Mary Jenkins. Ah. <laughs> I love that. Thank you, Mary. And again, uh, I'm going to put the link down below as well for those people that want to uh, donate and be one of those people that give five dollars for a year. Um, that will definitely be a link in the show notes as well so for those people that want to get hold of me i'm not sure why you would want to but <laughs> you can find me on uh, youtube as you know friends from wild places you can go watch the video version uh, please comment and subscribe tell me what you feel tell me if you like it don't like it what i can improve on every 
thing is welcome. So let me know. You can also find me on LinkedIn. That's my business, Shireen Boeta. Uh, Twitter as well for friends from wild places. But please do your thing. Share the podcast uh, wherever needed. Uh, your support is, is so appreciated. The website is friendsfromwildplaces.buzzsprout.com. That's friendsfromwildplaces.buzzsprout.com. And the last favor, if I can ask you guys, Mary, Chris, when you get a chance, you can find Friends From Wild Places' podcast on iTunes. Please go leave a review, even if it's not a nice one or it's a, a nice one or whatever. At least it's something so that I can get some feedback um but other than that guys thank you chris thank you mary and thanks for listening so see you next time guys and remember you got this and stay wild Bye. you as well christmas is my birthday no, how cute <laughs> happy holidays you've been listening to friends from wild places with shireen Guetta. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast from the links to catch every episode and unleash your passion.